Stay tuned for an updated discussion on so-called Christian polygamy. Next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? We were recently invited to Montana to talk to a group of people about polygamy in the Bible and explain why polygamy is not acceptable, uh, that God does not accept it, and uh, why we have come to that conclusion. Now, there seems to be an increase of people adopting the Christian polygamy idea. They practice multiple wifery, but it isn't based on the same false ideas of polygamy for eternal life on which Mormon polygamy was founded and established. There was a very sensitive and disruptive event where a legally married woman ran off to join a Christian polygamy group based somewhere in Utah. Mm. And there were also uh, members of a Christian church in that area that decided they wanted to be polygamists. (laughs) And they said that they prayed about it and claimed God was leading them to it, and so they did it. Inspiration, huh? uh, I guess. <laughs> now, now we know that God didn't tell them to be polygamous. We know that because it was God himself who said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah. And we've discussed this topic in the past, but decided to revisit it because more and more people are being led astray by this idea. And we need to do what God told us to do as expressed in the biblical book of Jude, verses 3 and 4. Yeah, great caution here. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So we're told to contend for the faith, yeah. the truth of God's word, and that's what we're doing. We don't know if these folks have been influenced by the local Mormon fundamentalists. We don't know if there's something or someone else that has convinced them that polygamy is okay, but we do know that God does not contradict himself and that he does not command or condone polygamy. So we're going to present some of their arguments and respond with biblical answers because that's what we do. (laughs) We bring (laughs) biblical truths to polygamists. Those who call themselves Christian polygamists do not consider polygamy a requirement to please God, which is what the Mormon polygamists believe, but they do say we're in the age of grace, so it's okay. They do use many of the same excuses for polygamy that Mormon fundamentalists use. Here are some examples. Yeah, three of them. Number one, there's no place in the Bible where God gave a command against polygamy or rebuked or punished those who did. Or two, nowhere in the Bible is polygamy condemned or criticized, let alone criminalized. And number three, nowhere in the Bible is polygamy called a sin. Now, of course, there's good arguments, and there's some very in-depth, you know, discussions we could have on this. But to simplify it, we're going to give some of the answers. Now, there are places in the Bible where polygamy is forbidden. But even if there wasn't, we cannot create a doctrine based on, uh, or a permission even, based on the Bible's silence Bible of it. Silence. For example, there's no place in the Bible that forbids a woman from taking plural husbands. But we don't see anybody scrambling to do that. <laughs> Next, God's reluctance to punish lawbreakers is not God's permission to break the law. Good point. And just because someone also jumps off the polygamous cliff doesn't establish that we should follow. Now, each biblical story of a polygamous family is explained and discussed in this Bible study on polygamy. It's called, Is Polygamy Biblical? And it, it documents and chronicles many of the, the families in the Bible who were polygamous, that polygamists use as examples why right. it's okay. And we will send this book to anybody who asks for it. It's free. Just ask for it. Email us or call us or however you want to contact us, and we'll send it to you. And, uh, and, and because we have talked about polygamous families in the Bible many times in the past, we're not going to go over the, the same families again. 
to show that polygamy is not acceptable to God. But we're going to kind of talk about a few other things instead. God told the first married couple to become one flesh. (laughs) He said, the two shall become one. He didn't make exception that three or four or more should become a married community of one man and several women. Jesus himself sustained original monogamy for marriage. In Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So when a man marries more than one woman, he has separated the original two becoming one, which Jesus said should not be done. That should really end the discussion. It should, (laughs) shouldn't it? Thou shalt not commit adultery should end the discussion too, but it for some reason doesn't. Now, Adam and Eve were originally without sin. They were innocent. There was no corruption in their actions, thoughts, or behaviors until they were tempted to disobey God and they ate the forbidden fruit. We read that Adam's disobedience brought disobedience to all humans. Yeah, in Romans 5, 19, it says, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And that one man is referring to Jesus, of course. course. Now, Adam's disobedience brought sin into the world, which renders all humanity sinful. And it's only through the one man, Jesus, that we can be made righteous. Polygamy doesn't do what only Jesus can do. Polygamists, even those embracing non-Mormon polygamy, use the Bible as justification. They claim that polygamy helps them become sanctified and righteous and less selfish. That polygamy gives opportunity to resist the results of sharing a man with other women. Obviously, They agree with Ephesians 4.22 that the flesh has been corrupted by sin and needs to be fixed. (laughs) Now, in Galatians 5.19 is a list of the corruptions of the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that says will not. It doesn't will say not. probably. It yeah. says will not. May not. <laughs> yeah. But will notice not. that polygamy causes these things. Polygamy causes sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. Polygamy is the cause of 11 of the 15 corruptions of the flesh. That should be sobering to anyone arguing for polygamy. Yeah, for sure. But polygamists believe that they can become more Christ-like through polygamy so they can learn not to be selfish and jealous and so on. That it can make men more patient and loving, but polygamy causes those reactions. It doesn't fix them. One lady who claims to be a Christian polygamist said she realized that she was being selfish by not sharing her husband with her younger sister. She said that polygamy would help her become less selfish. That is very odd logic. First of all, where in the Bible are we told that living polygamy will make us less selfish and more Christ-like? Nowhere. Nowhere. Sarah Pratt, who was the first wife of early Mormon apostle Orson Pratt, suffered through his uh, polygamous behavior, and his story reflects the lust of the flesh we described in Galatians 5.19. In her old age, Sarah Pratt finally left her old husband, who (laughs) continued to marry younger and younger plural wives, even though he couldn't support them. Sarah condemned polygamy, and she said this about it. Polygamy completely demoralizes good men and makes bad men correspondingly worse. As for the women, well, God help them. First wives, it renders desperate or else heartbroken, mean-spirited creatures. 
Here was my husband, gray-headed, taking to his bed young girls in mockery of marriage. Of course, there could be no joy for him in such an intercourse except for the indulgence of his fan fanaticism and of something else, perhaps which I hesitate to mention. <laughs> Now, an early Mormon writer who was studying Mormonism and Mormon polygamy uh, had came out to Utah and uh, and watched them and, you know, kind of yeah. talked and interviewed some of them, said, these poor people, all they were doing is looking for God and found this monster instead. Wow. And polygamy is a monster. Expecting polygamy to help people become sanctified is nothing more than inviting temptation into their lives so they can learn to resist temptation. It's like a rattlesnake taking into our beds and trusting that it won't bite us. And then, and, and then if it does bite us, trusting that it won't, the bite won't hurt us. The Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation. God will not lead us into polygamy so we can overcome the temptations that polygamy causes. Why would God lead us in to do something that causes bad behavior? Yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. That's against God's character. We have a verse from Romans explaining how we are delivered from temptation, and it's not through polygamy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Romans 7, 23 and 24. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So it's through Jesus Christ alone <laughs> yeah. that we can resist temptation and be delivered from the sinful nature. Polygamy causes the problems polygamists want to overcome. Jesus fixes them. He alone is the Savior from sin. And that's why gospel is called good news. That's it's right. good news. It is. It's good news. Leviticus 20 verse 8 tells us that it is the Lord who sanctifies us. The polygamists say polygamy does that. Many problems that result from polygamy are rarely talked about. They are mostly sexual sins. Once the boundaries are blurred, other boundaries are more easily disregarded or eliminated. Hmm. And for example, if the sons of a polygamous family watch their father going from woman to woman, sees his mother being treated as a doormat or suffering poverty, abuse, negligence, loneliness, and so on, he'll probably do the same thing probably as he is. matures. Yeah. Now, they teach and preach sexual purity to the female, but the males get to mess around with multiple <laughs> women. Okay, Contradictions become part of his thinking. A double standard becomes his religion. As we often say, polygamists use the Bible to justify their polygamy, but they neglect biblical sexual guidelines. Now, we mentioned poly uh, Leviticus chapter 20 up there a minute ago. We're going to go to chapter 20. We've often talked about Leviticus chapter 18, which pronounced um, condemnation right. on, on many of these sexual sins. And, and the God called detestable. But we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 20 this time and read more of what God said about that. Fascinating. Chapter 20, verses 14. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity. And you know what? Polygamists do that. And Joseph Smith did that. Joseph Smith did that. In verse 17, if a man takes his sister, a daughter of his father or a daughter of his mother, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness, and he shall bear his iniquity. In verses 19 through 21, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or of your father's sister, for that is to, be, is to make naked one's relative they shall bear their iniquity. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. And in verse 23, And you shall not walk in the customs of the nation that I am driving out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. 
Now, the word <laughs> uncover nakedness uh, includes promiscuity, incest, adultery, and all the other sexual misbehaviors. They understood it to mean all the right. different sexual... Now, people, and I, and I have heard a polygamist say this, that uncover nakedness doesn't mean having sex. It means you're <laughs> supposed to do it in the dark, I guess. Uh, but, but that's not what it means. If you get into the Hebrew and you want to read about it, get a Hebrew scholar, a Hebrew dictionary, and it means all of those sexual sins. Wow. And polygamists are guilty of them. And God says he detests them. Leviticus 18.18 18 prohibits a man from marrying sisters, which most polygamists allow. It's an easy way for a man to get more plural wives. But they argue that if the sisters agree to it, they're not rivals. <laughs> well, Christian polygamists use the same argument. However, there isn't one polygamous marriage where one of the wives isn't deprived of something because another wife got it. Yeah, that is rivalry. And especially with sisters, it's a worse rivalry. And it's forbidden by God. You know, it's forbidden by God. It's condemned by God. We remind our viewers again, before we leave Leviticus, that God sent the Israelites to the land of Canaan to rid the land of the pagan nations and their sexual deviations when God gave those sexual prohibitions. And then he ended it like this. Yeah, he's kicking them out because of, because of, of this. Yeah. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Now, that's serious stuff. I it don't is. know if the polygamists even understand what this means to them, but they need to get into it and, and, and find out what it means to them, because it's not good. Now, God did not say the words anywhere in the Bible, thou shalt not practice polygamy. But he did say in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5, thou shalt not commit adultery. And whether a man takes many wives or has many mistresses, it's all equally adultery. One of the best examples of God's plan for monogamy, not polygamy in the New Testament, is in the New Testament where we read that marriage between a man and a woman represents one Lord and one church. Okay? One polygamist countered that there are many people in Jesus' church, so that means a man can have many <laughs> wives. But that's not what the Bible says. Second, you know, uh, we're, we're one body, a body that is not fractioned or factioned. And Jesus has only one bride, a singular entity, and the language doesn't include a sexual relationship, but a covenant relationship of protection, provision, and love forever. One bright. And God gave Israel a certificate of divorce. Yeah. And among the reasons he mentions are their adulteries and idolatries. Anything you put ahead of what God's will is for you is idolatry. And polygamy is always put ahead of God's true will for us. Another example Christian polygamists use is in the Old Testament where the Levitical law says a brother is to marry the widow of his brother who has died. They believe this is where God commands polygamy. Mm. But the text doesn't say that. And we're told not to add to what's been written. Now here's the scripture. Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 through 7. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in to her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife... And then it tells us of a ritual oh, that they okay. can do, which isn't part of this. But, okay. but the, I mentioned verse 7 simply because 
this is not a requirement. It it may not have been honorable to refuse, but he can refuse. Sounds verse like seven. he can. Yeah, yeah he can refuse. Uh, and there are an, an instance where it probably happened in, in the book of Ruth. Now, next, there's nothing that indicates in this passage that the brother's already married. It doesn't say he's got another wife or no. house anywhere. In fact, he probably isn't because it stipulates, quote, if brothers dwell together. Which would mean they were single. Same probably. household, yeah. yeah. It's likely the other brother is single and doesn't have a separate house, wife, and family. Polygamists love to use the Bible to support polygamy, but they refuse to use the Bible to regulate <laughs> what they believe. Those who claim to be Christians and rely on the Bible as their permission to do it quickly forget that Christians of all people on the planet are to show an example of being law-abiding citizens. We are to obey our civil governments who make and uphold the law. From Romans 13, 1, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 16, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And Titus 3.1, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. And polygamy is against the law. It is. <laughs> In every state in the United States of America, it's illegal. They conveniently point out the scriptures don't condemn polygamy, but ignore the scriptures that don't allow polygamy or scriptures that point to monogamy. We have another quote. Yeah, from Luke 18, 29 and 30. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now, this is very interesting. Notice that the words parents yeah. and brothers and children are in the plural, but not the words wife and house. <laughs> They're in the singular. That's very interesting. One wife, one home. So it was, in Jesus' own words, it was normal to have one wife and one home, yeah. not many. And of course, those who desire the polygamous life, most, if not all of them, refer to Abraham, who was a great man in the Old Testament. He had more than one woman at a time, and we've discussed many times in the past. But we'll point a couple more things that maybe are overlooked by those who are blinded by the idea of having their own harems. Abraham took Hagar on the advice of Sarah, not on the command of God. That's right. Later, Sarah admitted it was wrong and told Abraham he needed to admit it was wrong, too. <laughs> Hagar had one child, Ishmael, by Abraham, and that's all. He left her alone after that. It was not an ongoing polygamous relationship. Then, 13 years later, Sarah told Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away. <laughs> And God told them to listen to to told him to listen to his wife and do it. So he did. So if you want to do the works of Abraham, if you're a polygamist and you want to do the works of Abraham, then you better set your plural wives free after you've made provision for her and her children. Good point. And finally, the spiritual application of Sarah and Hagar is clearly given in the New Testament book of Galatians. Yeah, verses. Uh... Uh, chapter 4, verse 22, and, and chapter 5, verse 1. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is for Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. 
But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of free woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So this tells us how to interpret the story yes. of Abraham and Sarah and, and Hagar. And, and, and it's very easily understood. Sarah, the monogamous wife, represents freedom. Hagar, the plural wife or concubine, represents slavery and bondage. And polygamy is precisely that, slavery and bondage. Mm. And that's not God's will for any of us. And you know, it's interesting that the LDS uh, Mormons, uh, the active church uh, that dropped it, uh, polygamy in 1890 or thereabouts, um, I don't think they really appreciate what all these scriptures are either. I don't, either. I don't think know. they do either. I don't think they realize what Joseph Smith was doing. And, uh, because they couldn't continue to justify Joseph Smith that they did understand it. And these are well, some of these are well-read men. I'm sure they read the Old Testament once in a while. And but those without question, this... Those without the Spirit of God cannot understand uh, the things of God, that, and they don't have the Spirit of God. And the sad thing is, is, truthfully, I think if the prophet, and he, I don't think he would, but if he ever said we're going to begin practicing polygamy again, you'd find many people practicing polygamy mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then you our know. job would double, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be, <laughs> it'd be a lot more interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> it'd be a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Earl. You bet. Appreciate your comments. You know, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us we need to learn how to handle the word of truth correctly. And, of course, that word is from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible. That requires study, trusting God alone and not proxy prophets to tell us what God wants us to know. Apostle Paul wrote that he was careful not to handle God's word deceitfully. And it's deceitful to claim polygamy is okay simply because the Bible records people who had more than one wife at a time. The beauty of truth is that it doesn't change. And there are many models in the Bible that monogamy, not polygamy, was God's plan from the very beginning. The first polygamist was one of Cain's great-grandsons. Cain and his family lived away from the presence of God. But the first marriage, monogamy, was performed by God in His presence and in a place called paradise. How's that for contrast? Thank you for watching. <laughs>